You're listening to FOJC Radio, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and teaching the doctrine of Christ to the whole world. Good evening and welcome to Friday Night FOJC Remnant Gathering. Grab your Bible and your pens and your paper, and when two or three are gathered in His name, the Lord is right here with us. So thank you for joining us, and here's Brother David. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the January 8th, 2021 edition of the FOJC Remnant Gathering. I am David Carrico, and we're so glad that all of you are joining us for the broadcast this evening. Our study for this evening is entitled Jehovah Shema. And as always, we have a lot of things that need prayer, so we're going to lift up some of these. Um, Brother Davis wants healing over health issues and wisdom on how to repel satanic attacks. Brother King wants prayer for his three daughters. Cindy needs healing from pain. Maddie from the UK is praying about a rental property. Uh, Greg, who is the moderator for Dan Badandi, is in need of healing. Kathy has had her identity stolen, and uh, there's just so many, many needs that are in the body, and so many that there are two more than we could put forth, each and every one, but we certainly do pray about them throughout the week. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you once again. We can come before you uh, a holy and a loving God and a just and a righteous God to bring forth our request to you and father we just want to lift up brother Davis that you just send healing to his body and that you just give give him wisdom on how to fight these satanic attacks we want to also pray for brother King and his daughters that you'll just do a tremendous work there in that family for all of those that are in need of healing, for Cindy, for her pain, uh, for Maddie who needs direction in the UK on the rental property, the healing for Greg, and for Kathy whose identity was stolen. Father, there's so many needs, and we know, Father, that in the name of Jesus, you can touch all those that need a touch in their body, that on the cross of Calvary, you died not only for our sins, but for our healing. By your stripes, we are healed. And we're putting our faith in that atonement for our healing and our salvation and for, for wisdom to walk out each and every situation in our life. So, Father, we just want to lift up all of these needs and all of the many others that we, we did not put forth audibly that you just meet them in your mighty way. Father, in this teaching this evening, we just pray, Father, that you help me to bring forth your word in clarity and truth and that you just give us the spiritual ears to hear. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and we agree. Amen and amen. Worship the Lord for just a few moments and we will be back with our message for this evening. Jehovah Shema. Sorry, because of the YouTube rules, we cannot put my music on this video recording. However, if you want to hear my music, you can listen to us live on Friday nights at 6 p.m. on our radio page. Or you can go to our podcast page and listen to the recordings there. That's FOJCRadio.com. Thank you. God bless. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to... Ezekiel chapter 48 and verse 35. It was round about 18,000 measures, and the name of the city from that day shall be, The Lord is there. And that in the Hebrew is Jehovah Shema, The Lord is there. And I am going to be teaching on the vision of the prophet Ezekiel it encompasses chapters 40 through 48 and the very concluding verse of that section 
it ends with the Lord is there, Jehovah Shema being the name of the city. And this points out the most important thing about everything that Ezekiel was trying to teach. He was trying to show the presence of God with his people. It had been a time when the temple had been destroyed and God's people were very sad and they were uh, struggling with getting a grip on God's presence without the physical temple. Many of us today are in the same struggle. We, Many people that are listening to us, you don't have a regular assembly or a lot of friends around you. You're isolated and you can struggle with keeping hold upon the presence of God. Now, Charles Spurgeon preached a sermon on uh, Jehovah Shema, and it was uh, in 1891, and he said this, It is esteemed by the prophet to be the highest blessing that could come upon a city that its name should be Jehovah Shema, the Lord is there. Doubtless many would be greatly pleased if there were no God at all. For in their hearts they say, No God. God is not to them a father, a friend, a trust, a treasure. If they were to speak from their hearts and could hope for a satisfactory answer, they would ask, Whither can I flee from his presence? If a spot could be found wherein there would be no God, what a fine building speculation might be made there. Millions would emigrate to no God's land. And... I can't help but think of our nation as we uh, hear the words of Spurgeon about people wanting to go to no God's land. There are many people that are working feverishly to turn our nation into no God's land, and they have certainly done a very good job of that. But just as in the situation when the Lord showed Ezekiel, Jehovah Shema, the Lord is there. He is going to do the very same thing with us. Now, there's something that will be in continual conflict as I unpack this passage of Scripture. There's a popular doctrine that is called the Millennial Reign. Okay, we back on? There's a popular doctrine, and I'll I'll just start again here. Um, with my thought. One of the things that will keep many people from understanding the deeper truths of Scripture is false doctrine. And there's a very popular doctrine called the Millennial Reign. And the Millennial Reign basically interprets Isaiah chapter 40 through 48 as referring to a future millennial temple. I'll read that interpretation from the Bible Knowledge Commentary that was put out by Dallas Theological Seminary. And it says, Ezekiel was led on a tour of the future millennial temple, which he recorded in remarkable detail. See the sketch, the millennial temple. And they have multiple drawings here entitled the millennial temple where they take the vision of Ezekiel, and interpret it in that manner. Now, one of the immediate problems with that, the Bible doesn't say that that's what it is. There is not one word in all of Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48 that says that this is a millennial temple. Not one word. Now, I have always found if you want truth, you will interpret the word of God by what it says and not by what it does not say. And what they have done, they have taken this doctrine, and they have read it into these chapters. Now, many places as we go through our study, the Bible does not say that it is a future millennial temple. And many places, it indeed says that it is something else. And the something else that the Lord is pointing us to in these chapters is extremely important. It is the very key to understanding Jehovah Shammah, the presence of the Lord with us. Now, the the problem is uh, in 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And there are many people that are very intelligent that 
can think logically in many ways, but when it comes to this doctrine and other doctrines, they cannot see the forest for the trees because they have bought in to this false doctrine and they cannot see the word of God nor understand it because they're blinded. And the Bible will clearly say that it's something else multiple times. We're going to see time after time. But their minds are blinded and there are spirits involved. It's not a matter of people lacking intelligence, but there's a spiritual blinding here and Satan's desire to keep people from the most important truth that we could learn, the key to understanding and experiencing Jehovah Shema. The Lord is there to understanding his presence. In the book of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And just like Brother Spurgeon said, immediately after the fall, after the sin, Adam and Eve wanted to head for no God's land. They run from the presence of God. And in 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 21, we see the story of the Ark of the Covenant being taken away from Israel and being carried away into the Philistines. And in, in 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 21, and she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel because the Ark of God was taken and because of her father-in-law and her husband. They named the child Ichabod, the glory has departed. And there are so many assemblies, and I would indeed say, I, you know, and I can't give a number, but uh, almost all of the 501c3 assemblies have Ichabod written over the door. Uh, they had bought in hook, line, and sinker to everything but the truth of God and the doctrine of Christ. Now, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 40, and that's, let's make our way through a few verses here. And it will immediately become apparent that we are going to have to choose between what the Bible says and what many people would want us to believe in interpreting this scripture uh, passage as some future millennial reign. And always, when I interpret scripture, It'll be by the doctrine of Christ, and I will let Scripture interpret Scripture. This passage is about Jehovah Shema, us experiencing the presence of God right now. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 40 and verse 1, In the five and twentieth year of our captivity, in the beginning of the year, in the tenth day of the month, in the fourteenth year, after the city was smitten, in the selfsame day the hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me thither. Now, in this first verse, it clearly tells us that it is 14 years since the Babylonians came in with Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C. They destroyed the temple and most of the city. So there is no temple in Jerusalem now. It has been 14 years since there was a temple standing in Jerusalem. And now, in the time of great struggle of the remnant of Israel, the Lord is sending this encouraging word of Jehovah Shammah. And this is what it's all about, showing the remnant how to experience the presence of God right now. And in verse 2, the scripture says, In the visions of God brought me into the land of Israel and set me upon a very high mountain by which was as the frame of a city on the south. And in a vision, Ezekiel was taken unto Israel and he was taken up upon a very high mountain. Now, it's very plain and, well, it is really plain in Scripture what Ezekiel is saying, but it's not plain because of all the confusion that's sold by modern doctrine. But I'll read John Gill and his comment on Ezekiel chapter 40 and verse 2. It says, And he set me upon a very high mountain, as John also was, that he might have a view of this large city and temple, which were to fill the whole world. And his brother Gil and as many other have understood, 
Ezekiel was seeing a vision of the new Jerusalem, and the Lord was showing him that revelation right then. In the book of Revelation, chapter 21, and verse 10, the scripture says, and this is speaking, of course, of the apostle John, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and shewed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. The very same language, the very same description. Ezekiel was getting a tour of New Jerusalem just like the apostle John did. And if we will understand that and believe what the Bible does say instead of what the Bible doesn't say, we are going to have some some amazing revelations into the understanding of Jehovah Shammah. In the book of Hebrews chapter 12, this isn't something that the Lord wants us to experience sometime in the distant future after he returns, but this is a right now word unto, it was a right now word unto the remnant of Israel in the days of Ezekiel. It's a right now word unto us right now pardon the pun, and in Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 22, but ye are not come, but excuse me, but ye are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and of the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. You see, Ezekiel was taken, the apostle John was taken, and the Lord wants us also to come to that heavenly city to accept experience and the reality of Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is there. In verse 25, see that ye refuse him not that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on the earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Jesus at this very moment is at the right hand of the Father and he is speaking from heaven. Do not refuse him. Do not refuse him, because he is calling the church back unto himself. In Isaiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 2, Isaiah prophesied about this mountain, and it shall come to pass in the last days. Anybody here a believer in the last days? I see those hands. That the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the tops of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. I am saying that all the time. Come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord. We can go. We're seated with him in heavenly places, Ephesians 2, 6. We can come boldly before the throne of grace, Hebrews 4, 16. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. Let's go to the, the assembly of the firstborn in Hebrews 12, to the house of Jacob, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways. Jesus is speaking from the right hand of the Father. He wants to teach you his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And right now, the word of the Lord is going forth from Jerusalem, not that earthly city. Nah, that earthly city, they have rejected Jesus Christ. They have embraced the Kabbalah. They have officially as a nation rejected him, but yet the word of the Lord is going forth from Jerusalem because it's going forth from the heavenly Jerusalem where Jesus is at the right hand of the Father and he will one day come down and the new Jerusalem will come down with him. In Ezekiel chapter 17 Verses 22 and verse 23, there are many Bible prophecies that give the prophetic emphasis of the remnant of God being gathered together, not around the earthly Jerusalem, but around the heavenly. This is Jehovah Shammah, Ezekiel 17, beginning in verse 22. Thus saith the Lord God, 
I will also take of the highest branch of the high cedar, and I will set it, and I will crop off from the top of his young twigs a tender one, and I will plant it upon a high, an high mountain and eminent. And the remnant of Israel is planted on that high mountain. That is where we dwell. In the mountain of the height of Israel, I will plant it, and it shall bring forth boughs and bear fruit and be a goodly cedar. And under it shall dwell all fowl of every wing and the shadow of the branches thereof shall they dwell. The, in the book of Enoch, the book of Enoch speaks about this mountain. And many of you, I imagine, heard the uh, midnight ride we did uh, on uh, last Saturday night where we talked about these things. We talked about it and also... In our Book of Enoch commentary we aired this week, we've been talking about the mountain, the mountain that is there, that is um, literally a gate or portal into the third heaven, and the Bible has a lot to say about legitimate and illegitimate access. And in the Book of Enoch, chapter 17 and verse 2, and they brought me to the place of darkness and to a mountain, the point of whose summit reached to the heaven. So this is what we're talking about. We're talking about that spiritual mountain. We're talking about that new Jerusalem. And when we can understand the truth here that's unfolded in this text from Jehovah Shema, it's going to be such a treasure to us. Now, let's look at Ezekiel in the 40th chapter and the third verse. And he brought me thither, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass, with a line of flax in his hand, and a measuring reed, and he stood in the gate. Well, I wonder who that guy is. Yeah, uh, we're going to see that this is indeed uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. He appeared to Ezekiel in chapter 1, verse 26. And John Wesley says of this verse, the same no doubt that appeared to the prophet in chapter 1, verse 26, whose name is the branch and who builds the temple, Zechariah 6, 12 and 13, whose color was like burnished brass. And this is indeed Jesus appearing to give Ezekiel a tour of the new Jerusalem, just like he will do to the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. Now, in the text that Brother Wesley referred to in Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 26, it says, And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. The Lord Jesus Christ appeared to Ezekiel. He returned he appeared to him in a vision to take him on a tour of New Jerusalem. And just to double down on Jehovah Shema in Revelation chapter one, beginning in verse thirteen, the same description was given by the Apostle John. And he says, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And indeed, this is the revelation of the true temple of God. And the temple of God was ordained by the Father, as was the tabernacle, as a place of worship upon earth. But the Lord knew it wasn't any surprise to the Father when they desecrated the temple and did what they did and 
always the true temple has been in heaven. And Zechariah chapter 6 and verse 12, it prophesies of Jesus Christ as the one that will rebuild the temple. And the temple that he's going to build, it's not going to be some millennial temple and some earthly Jewish kingdom upon the earth. But in Zechariah chapter 6 and verse 12, And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. The only temple that Jesus ever talked about building was the temple of his body. As each and every believer, we are the Israel of God. We are the temple of God. We are the priesthood of God. And we are the only temple, the only priesthood that there is. All others are illegitimate knockoffs, whether it be the priesthood of Roman Catholicism or of Mormonism, or you pick one. We are the priest of the Most High God after the order of Melchizedek. And in John chapter 2, Jesus makes it about as plain for us as he could in John chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. Then answers the Jews and said unto him, What sign shewest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. We have to be very clear that the only temple Jesus ever said he was going to build is the temple of his body. And then the apostle Paul said, Know ye not that you're the temple of the living God? And a lot of people would say amen to that. But they don't really realize that we are the temple and we are the only temple that God has. All others are illegitimate knockoffs. In Ephesians chapter 5, we come in here to the concept of the bride. And right now, who will dwell in the holy city of New Jerusalem will be determined by the refinement of the bride. In Ephesians chapter 4, under the the parable of the church referring to Christ, in Ephesians 5.24, therefore as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So the woman is the bride of the husband, and the church, the ecclesia, is the bride of Christ. Now in verse 26, it says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself. And there will be a point in time where Jesus is going to present the bride unto himself. A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And this is the time when the Lord is getting the wrinkles out. Because one day he is going to present the body of believers unto himself and the bride is going to enter in to the bridal chamber. And in Revelation chapter 21, or excuse me, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 7, this is the time of the preparation of the bride. So could we really call the ecclesia the bride of Christ? Not really, because it would be proper to say that we are the bride in preparation. And when Jesus will present the bride to himself, there's going to be some that are going to have spots and wrinkles, and they're not going to enter in. In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 7, 
Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. This is the time for the bride to get ready, because there will be a day when Jesus will present us unto himself, and when he does, he is going to take us into New Jerusalem, and only when the church is presented unto Christ by himself and he takes it into New Jerusalem, then we will be the bride. There will be a uniting of the believers in Christ that have purified themselves and the New Jerusalem that is coming down, Jehovah Shammah, Revelation 21.2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That's what the Lord has in store for us, eternally dwelling in Jehovah Shema. Now is the time for us to get ourselves ready and to prepare ourselves, to totally set apart ourselves unto Jesus Christ with no unfaithfulness unto other things that are going to sully and defile our garments. Now in Ezekiel chapter 40 and verse 4, there's another thing here that's as plain as day. Here's another place where we come in to start contradiction where you're going to either have to choose. You're going to have to either say, that, well, this is talking about the millennial reign, which the Bible doesn't say, or you're going to have to go with the Bible and say, well, you know, we're going to go with what the Bible does say. Now, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 40, verse 4, And the man said unto me, Son of man, behold with thine eyes, and hear with thine ears, and set thine heart upon all that I shall show thee, for to the intent that I might show them unto thee art thou brought hither, declare all that thou seest to the house of Israel. According to the word of God, this was a right now message. God was showing this to Ezekiel so he could meditate. And these words are so strong. Set your heart upon everything I show you because I want you to show the revelation and the spiritual understanding of this under the remnant of God. And it's all about Jehovah Shama. That's what it's all about. It's not about something in the distant past. It's not about something in the distant future. The revelation unto Ezekiel was that God's remnant could experience Jehovah Shema right then. That's the reason why it teaches in the 12th chapter of Hebrews and gives us the invitation to come to the general assembly of the firstborn. This is why the revelation was given unto the apostle John. Matthew Poole said, on the fourth verse of the 40th chapter of Ezekiel. Diligently view all accurateness is required here in looking into these things presented to the eye. You see, there's something profoundly spiritual in every, and a lot of people, they read the description of the uh, dimensions of this city and it doesn't mean much to them, but there's profound symbolism in everything that the Lord is revealing here. He never just puts ink on paper to just take up space or give people something to do, and here is something that the Lord told Ezekiel. You meditate on it. You sit with it until the spiritual understanding comes to you, and the minute that you buy in to this lie of the millennial reign, you're not going to get any of it. You're going to be totally redirected from Jehovah Shema to some uh, John Darby's pipe dream that's going to be an earthly Jewish kingdom on earth. Now, Brother Poole goes on to say, These kind of phrases do bind us to the greatest heedfulness. Set thine heart upon, ponder, and weigh with thyself, meditate, and study on them. Though here is a supernatural revelation 
yet he is required to act the utmost part of a man to know the things revealed. That's on all of us. We are to sit with this. We are to pray about this. We are to get the spiritual revelation of what God is giving because there is nothing more important than Jehovah Shema. All, and the word all here, Brother Poole said, nothing is insignificant here. Therefore, all must be regarded. Declare, plainly tell them that they may discern and tell all. Conceal nothing. And what happens when someone is blinded by a false doctrine? And I have said over and over that every false doctrine is there by design to keep you from discerning and understanding a very precious spiritual truth. And once, you see, you buy in to a false doctrine in your mind, and your mind is blinded. But most definitely, spirits do get involved. So when I, and you see, it's fruitless. When you try to talk someone and you can only speak into their intellect, they're not going to get it because they can only understand the things of God through the Holy Spirit and by believing what the Bible does say instead of what the Bible doesn't say. And in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 40, and verse 5, it talks about an enclosing wall. Ezekiel chapter 40 verse 5, and behold a wall on the outside of the house round about and in the man's hand a measuring reed of six cubits long by the cubit and an hand breadth. So he measured the breadth of the building one reed and the height one reed. And this is more than just some wall that the Lord wants to tell us about Brother Lang said this, But as the boundary line between the sacred and profane, which being drawn by the hand of God, must therefore remain free from all interference on the part of man. This is a wall that is going to absolutely keep out anything that is going to defile from this spiritual safe place. You see, we have a spiritual safety zone. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, Psalm 91 and 1. And Revelation chapter 21, verse 27, there's a wall around that temple in Ezekiel, and there's a big wall and a protector around that New Jerusalem because it's the same thing. Revelation 21, 27, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And we were talking in our Enoch series that we broadcast Thursday, and in that we were talking a little bit about this verse. And you know it says here that... Uh, there, there won't enter anything into it that defileth. You know, well, the Bible says that eating pork will defile you. Well, I wonder if maybe that might be a more important issue than a lot of people have ever thought about. But uh, it's time for us to think about it. It's time for us to get the wrinkles out. It's time to let the Lord put the hot iron on us and iron out the wrinkles because we're getting ready. We're getting ready for Jehovah Shema. The bride is making herself ready, and the Lord Jesus is going to present us unto himself when he returns, and we will have the marriage supper of the Lamb in New Jerusalem. I'm going to take a break. And we're going to be right back with so much more on the FOJC Remnant Gathering. We have much to offer here on FOJCRadio.com. Most listeners are familiar with our radio page where we're live on Fridays at 6 p.m. Central Time. And in, it includes our chat room where listeners can fellowship and read the scriptures that I post while Brother David's teaching. If you can't catch us live, we offer our podcast page with the latest audios of our remnant gatherings or the same audios 
are made into videos and now videos on two new video channels. The easiest way to find our new channels is to go to our ministry news page on FOJCRadio.com. On that page, you'll find links to our new channels uh, on Brideon and the Underground Church FOJC. And there's also links to our Doctrine of Christ series on Jimmy Vision and our Vault series. This makes it a lot easier for you to get the information with just a click. You'll find if there's going to be any events, we have that information on there. And we have um, a link to our free books and lots of other info. The latest info is on the ministry news page. I've tried to include answers to frequently asked questions on our Hot Topics page. We also try to help our listeners find local fellowship in their area with the Remnant Locations page. And for those who struggle with abuse issues, I offer my Ritual Abuse and Healing page. Our contact page has a short order form, some links for your love gifts, and of course, our contact information. On our resources page, you can find a list of our books, CDs, DVDs, free Bible studies, and tracts that can be printed or read. Check out our online Bible school or our music page. Both include easy-to-click audio files. And most important is our God Wants to Save You page. If you need help in leading someone to the saving mercy and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are plenty of uh, things to choose from on that page, including a little prayer that I wrote uh, to help lead people to accepting the Lord and inviting Him to be their Lord and Savior. It's all there, all free. So please use these many things that we offer on our website. We appreciate your support and have tried to make our site easy to navigate. But if you have a problem finding something, just email me at lastdayschurch at cs.com and I will be happy to help. Blessings to all our listeners and thanks again for your prayers and encouragement. Now back to tonight's message with Brother David Carrico on FOJC Radio. Welcome back to the FOJC Remnant Gathering. And as I always do at the break, I want to sincerely thank each and every one of you for praying with us, praying for us, and studying with us, and for supporting us with your gifts and your kindness. We thank you so much from the bottom of our heart. We're going to return to the book of Ezekiel. We have some more work to do here, some very important truths that we want to share. And we're going to begin in Ezekiel chapter 40 and verse 6 as we learn a little more about Jehovah Shema, the new Jerusalem. In Ezekiel chapter 40, beginning in verse 6 through 16, it describes the eastern gate. And in Ezekiel chapter 40 and verse 6, Then came he unto the gate which looketh toward the east, and he went toward the east, and went up the stairs thereof. Now I want you to note, there are stairs here in this gate. Thereof, and measured the threshold of the gate. Number two, there are stairs. Number one, there are stairs. Number two, this gate is measured, which was one reed broad, and the other threshold of the gate, which was one reed broad broad. Now, in the book of Ezekiel, and the way to understand the Bible is to let Scripture interpret Scripture. Always take for your guideline the doctrine of Christ, and always let Scripture interpret Scripture. And when you bring to the table preconceived ideas, you can take a doctrine of man, which could very well be a doctrine of a devil, and you could read that into the scripture. Now, there's what's called eisegesis and exegesis. And when you do what's called exegesis, you draw the truth out of scripture. 
And when you do what is called eisegesis, you take a preconceived idea or a doctrine as the millennial reign, pre trib rapture, pick one, and you read that scenario into the scripture. But we want to draw the truth out of the word of God and let scripture interpret scripture. So when the Bible says this is all about Jehovah Shema, that's what we're going with. Oh yeah, because that's, that's good. Now, here in the Eastern Gate, let's go back earlier into the book of Ezekiel and we will understand the profound significance of the Eastern Gate as it relates to Jehovah Shema. And in chapter 8 of the book of Ezekiel, and chapter 16, there were some bad things that took place here. What, Donna? Yeah, Ezekiel eight sixteen, And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, and they worship the sun toward the toward the east, and here in this gate was one of the profound places of apostasy. This is where Satan set up his stronghold to destroy and defile the temple of God, and just like Satan destroyed and defiled the physical temple, he also wants to destroy and defile you. We cannot give him any place. We must allow the Lord to continue that work of the preparation of the bride in us. In Ezekiel chapter 10 and verse 19, we learn more about the significance here of the eastern gate. In Ezekiel chapter 10 and verse 19, And the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. When they went out, the wheels also were beside them, and every one stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. This was the very place, and these cherubim, in Ezekiel chapter 1 and also in chapter 10, the cherubim literally transported Jesus Christ to the, the earth to appear under the prophet Ezekiel. And now, as the cherubim leave the temple in the very place where this abomination was committed, the cherubim move from the threshold and they come right out and they linger there on the, at the eastern gate so that this pause is a very dramatic pause. Everybody needs to know and understand that the abomination that took place there, the worship of the sun, and oh, my, what, oh boy, we boy would just be meddling if we talked about the changing of the Sabbath, wouldn't we? Uh, well, you know, there's a lot of things we need to take a lot more serious than what we do. We need to honor God's precepts and God's Sabbaths and God's law and God's ordinances. In, in Ezekiel chapter 10 and verse 19, we see them hovering there as they leave the temple. And you see the presence of God here is leaving the temple. And in Ezekiel chapter 11, beginning in verse 1, Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the east gate of the Lord's house, which looketh eastward, and behold, at the door of the gate, five and twenty men, among whom I saw Jazaniah, the son of Azur, and Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, princes of the people. Then said he unto me, Son of man, these are men that devise mischief and give wicked counsel in the city. There is much evil that is taking place among the polluters of the temple at the eastern gate. God's presence can no longer abide this. And in a dramatic pause, we see the, the Spirit of God lingering there. And in verse 16 of Ezekiel chapter 11, and then we see the Spirit of God just completely move. In Ezekiel chapter 11, and verse 23, 
And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. That is the Mount of Olives. So we see the dramatic pause, the cherubim and the glory of God. They hang over the eastern gate to emphasize unto these people that have rebelled against God. It's because of what you have done right here at the eastern gate, that God's presence is leaving the temple. And there are many people, when it comes time for them to be presented unto the Lord, that instead of, instead of the Lord presenting them and taking them into New Jerusalem, the Lord is going to say, your garments are filthy, you're defiled, you can in no wise enter in that which I have prepared for you. In Ezekiel 11, verse 16, Therefore say, Thus saith the Lord God, although I have cast them far off among the heathen, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet I will be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. So you see, it doesn't matter if the judgment of God brought on by these wicked men and their pagan idolatry caused the temple to be destroyed because God will be a little sanctuary to you. This is the message that the Lord wanted Ezekiel to proclaim to them right now. It doesn't matter. The earthly temple's gone. There is a heavenly temple. It's New Jerusalem. It will one day come down, and I will be a little sanctuary to each and every one. You can come into my presence. You can experience Jehovah Shammah. In Matthew chapter 24, we see the very same thing happening. Jesus appeared to the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 1. He was brought down by the cherubims. In Ezekiel chapter 40, we see Jesus coming back and taking the prophet Ezekiel on a tour of the New Jerusalem to show him the, un, the blessed message of Jehovah Shammah that he wanted him to deliver unto the remnant. In Matthew chapter 24, we see Jesus leaving the temple. In Matthew chapter 24, and verse 1, And Jesus went out and departed out of the temple. And Jesus is going out of the very same gate that he went out of in the days of Ezekiel. And his disciples came to him, for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Jesus prophesied the destruction of Herod's temple, just like the prophets prophesied the destruction of Solomon's temple. And in verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives. Now, when the glory of God and the cherubims hovered over the eastern gate, where did the glory of God go? Right out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus was with the cherubim, leaving the temple in the days of Ezekiel. Now, Jesus does the very same thing. He goes out through the same gate. He pronounces judgment on the temple. And he goes to the Mount of Olives, just like he did in the days of Ezekiel. And at that moment and at that time, the fate of the temple in Jerusalem, Herod's temple, it was sealed. And in A.D. 70, the Romans and the general Titus, they did a real number on it, didn't they? In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20, the same word comes unto us right now that came unto the remnant of Israel in the days of Ezekiel, the message to the Israel of God, I will be a little sanctuary unto you, Jehovah Shammah, in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them, Jehovah Shammah. It doesn't say where 20 or 30 are gathered or where two or 300, but where two or three are gathered together, there the Lord is there, Jehovah Shema, because we are the temple and the habitation wherein the Spirit of God does dwell. In Luke chapter 13, 
and verses 24 and 25, you see that eastern gate was measured. Jesus measured that gate. And we know what Jesus says about the gate, don't we? You see, most people aren't going to go through this gate. Most people are not going to get this. But many people are going to get this. They're going to understand Jehovah Shema. And many people that hear this teaching, whenever you hear Ezekiel 40 through 48 talked about, you're going to know it's Jehovah Shema, not some uh, millennial reign, millennial temple. Luke chapter 13, verses 24 and 25. Strive. Now, what does that word strive mean? It means you really put out an effort. You exert your little self. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. Well, if you know the Bible says pork defiles, you think maybe you better look some scriptures up and do a little praying? Uh, you think maybe uh, that might have something to do with getting through the straight gate if you're trying to bring in 10 pounds of pork chops? I'm just saying, now's the time to get the spots and the wrinkles out. Verse 24, strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Listen to what Jesus said. Many people are going to think they can walk right through that gate. And when the Lord Jesus presents the bride unto himself to go unto New Jerusalem, many, not just a few, but many people are going to think they're going in that are not going in because they are defiled. We are to strive, we are to put every effort in to going in through the straight gate. In verse 25, when once the master of the house has risen up and is shut to the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. In other words, I love this, the way it's, Jesus puts it here in the Gospel of Luke. In other words, I don't know you where you are. You know, you're over there underneath the Christmas tree. I'm not under the Christmas tree. I'm over here in the straight gate. You're over there at the Easter egg hunt with the Freemason pastors there in that apostate assembly. Hey, I'm over here in the straight gate. You think you can live your life in apostasy, defile yourself with everything the Bible says not to do, and then you can just walk in like you're all that in a bag of chips? You better strive. You better strive. You better get serious and cooperate with the Holy Spirit as he comes to iron out the spots and the wrinkles. And let me tell you, that iron's hot. The way you iron out a wrinkle in a garment, you put the hot iron on it. But let me tell you what, it's better than being refused to go through that straight gate. We pointed out in Ezekiel chapter 40 verse 6 that that gate is measured and there are stairs in this gate. In Psalm chapter 24. Psalm chapter 24. And I want to read verses 3 through 5. And the scripture says this. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? You see, this is talking about the very same thing. You know, who's going to stand here? Who's going to go through that gate? Who's going to climb up those stairs? He, in verse 4, He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity. Mark chapter 7. Jesus said, In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Have you lifted up your soul under the commandments of men, or are you really believing the doctrine of Christ in the Bible? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, maybe on your knees, at a Masonic altar, swearing a death oath. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. You see, there's stairs there. And to go up those stairs, there's only one way to go up them. We have to come the Lord's way, and we cannot come our own. The way of vanity will not take you through that gate. And just, you know... We, we just have to be 
say what the Bible says, most people aren't going to go through. There's going to be many, many people that are going to think they're going to through, and they're not. We need to strive, don't we? We need to get serious with God. And it is truly only our faith that saves us, but that faith is going to lead us to walk in all of the light we have. In Ezekiel chapter 40 and verse 10, And the little chambers of the gate eastward were three on this side and three on that side. They three were in one measure, and the post had one measure on this side and on that side. Now, what these little chambers were, they were guard houses. And literally, we see guards, and we see chambers with guards that nobody is going to come up in here. When the Bible says that, uh, you know, nothing is going to defile, these are guard stations. Lang said this, A return to the guard rooms of the East Gate, they are six in number, three on one side, fronting three on the other, and all of the same size. Watches at each of the three outer gates and the same at the three inner gates, for God himself will be the proper guardian and protector of this sanctuary of his people. There's going to be some security here. When the Bible says that nothing unclean is going to enter in, that's just exactly what it means. These stations, they were guard stations where the watchman would be there to watch that which was transpiring. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 17, the Lord called Ezekiel to be a watchman. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word of of the Lord, excuse me, therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. And a lot of people, when you have someone that will warn you, you know, I, I will warn you because this is serious stuff. We are to receive the word of the Lord and to warn people. That's what being a watchman is. And I tell you what, the prophet Isaiah had it right. When he talked about the watchmen that were there in the days of Ezekiel and the days of Isaiah and the watchmen today, in Isaiah chapter 56 and verse 10, his watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs that cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough. And there are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his gain from his quarter. If you don't believe they can't have enough, tune in to Paula White. She still ain't got enough money. She's still asking for more. Turn in to old Kenny Copeland. You know, if they're going to make you think that God's going to go broke and go out of business if you don't give your money to them. And if you don't give your money to them, well, whatever's wrong with you, it's because you ain't giving money to them. They're a bunch of greedy dogs. They'll never have enough. And they'll never run out of lies to twist and intimidate you to give them their money. They're blind watchmen. There's such an opportunity that there's so much they can say that needs to be said, but they're not going to do that because they are out for money, because they are greedy dogs, and they are blind watchmen. In Psalm 127 and 1, Psalm 127 and verse 1, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. If we preach the gospel of the kingdom, and if we teach the doctrine of Christ, God will build his church. Going on, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. 
And, you know, this is the problem with the understanding of Ezekiel 40 through 48. The popular teaching, they don't even have the right city. They don't have the right city, and they don't have any watchmen. They've got a false doctrine, and they've got a bunch of blind dog watchmen that won't bark over nothing. I would just bet, and I'll just get a little cynical here, but I bet if I would go out here uh, into southern Indiana... And if I would find ten churches that are teaching the doctrine of the millennial reign, I bet each and every one of them would also be teaching and, and would be absolutely silent, not taking a stand on Freemasonry. I bet every one of them will have their pork dinners at the barbecue. I bet every one of them will reject the true Sabbath. I bet every one of them will tell you that the law has passed away. Do we see a connection here between the blind dogs and the false watchmen and what the Word of God really says? It's all about Jehovah Shema. And we have a little sanctuary. He will be a little sanctuary unto you, and he will connect you with those that he wants you to be connected with. And I'm going to close our teaching this evening in Psalm 11 and verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? There's only one foundation that can be laid, and that's Jesus Christ. And if that foundation has been destroyed, uh, you're not in a, in, a, in a city or a foundation that the Lord is building and you can't be a watchman in a church like this you can't i mean the foundation's destroyed you cannot serve god in an atmosphere like this you're just going to waste your time and uh waste your energy jehovah shema that's what ezekiel chapter 40 through 48 is all about and this is a very very important message that the remnant of israel needs to hear right now just as they needed to hear it in the days of Ezekiel. Well, I'm going to close our lesson for this evening at this point with great thankfulness to all of you that have joined us once again to study the Word of the Lord. Uh, tomorrow night, I'll be heading about 20 feet north into the Now You See TV studios where we will be doing the Midnight Ride uh, we invite all of you to join us for that. It's going to be a good one. It really is. I'm excited about it. And uh, we're just thankful for, for what the Lord is doing uh, on so many avenues. Uh, last Wednesday night, I recorded with Jimmy Cooper the last DOC of Season 3. It's hard to believe we've already done over 60 episodes in the Doctrine of Christ series. And we'll be taking about a month off. And then probably the first week of February, we will begin recording again. And they always air a week late uh, because Jimmy will do the editing and put all the bells and whistles on it. So uh, I think that uh, Jimmy's probably going to upload some vaults there during this time period on the Underground Church channel. But we are just so very thankful for what the Lord is doing. We're excited. Uh, it's a time to get excited because truly... In these last days, and nothing could be more appropriate because it's a sin. You know, it's just a sin to fellowship and worship in, in most of these assemblies. And I'm probably being very kind to him saying that. These are the days of apostasy, and we have to learn the lesson of Jehovah Shema, how that he will be a little sanctuary unto us. Let's close out with a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you so much for each and every one that joined us for this study. Father, we just pray that you take this word and you use it to the building of your kingdom. And Father, we just pray the greatest encouragement and blessing upon our listeners that we draw close to you and we get ready for that time when you are going to present us to yourself and take us into that new Jerusalem. So Father, we just pray that you just take this word and we'll give you all the glory for everything good that happens. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and we agree. Amen and amen. God bless you all. And we will see you next Friday night, 6 p.m. Central, on the FOJC Remnant Gathering.
Thank you for listening and joining in fellowship with us here at FOJC Radio Remnant Gathering. You can contact us at FOJC Post Office Box 671 Tell City, Indiana 47586 or you can email us at Last Days Church at cs.com or you may call us at 812-836-2288 you can check out our website at www.fojcradio.com thanks and god bless